It's my privilege to open up God's Word with you this morning. We are currently in a series called Deeper. We said two weeks ago and last week that our deeper journey is about an invitation. And it is about an invitation to know, to understand, to experience, to listen, to transform, to see, to feel, to read, to love, to give, and to share deeper. The series is an invitation to journey deeper with Jesus. Now, I said earlier that we are a disciple making church. This is a discipleship journey. It's 12 weeks in which we are trusting God to awaken the hearts and spirits of our people, to see and to accept the invitation from Him to be with Him, to say yes, and then to follow with expectation and with obedience. As I was running this morning, I spent quite some time on the road. I was praying for everyone from our church whose faces and names I could remember. And as I was praying for them, I could see them being added. You know, like a, one of those tile mosaics, you know, like add a photo, add a photo, add a photo, add another photo, zoom out, add more, add more. And then all of a sudden you have this massive collection of little blocks with faces. That's how I felt as I was praying through everyone's lives and uh, uh, through what I know about them at least. And then there was a moment where I, I just asked God, I was like, just break into their lives with your light this morning. Like, just wake them up and let them go, oh, God is glorious, what a wonderful day, let's do this, you know. And I just saw this light breaking through barriers of darkness and stuff in people's lives. That is what we are trusting God to do in this time and through this series. Note, if you enrolled for deeper or for the deeper journey, which is our discipleship uh, 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 journey led by Josie, the sermon texts of this series will complement the nine deeper journey sessions uh, that she presents and teaches. Week one, I did the invitation. And week two, which was last week, uh, Peter spoke about a precious treasure, a priceless pearl, and also this painful experience of letting go what you have to acquire this one thing that could be described as precious and priceless. And how fulfilling it is once you do discover the greatest love of all is yours. I thought it was a beautiful, beautiful sermon. So we went really deep already. And we're going to do that again today. Our teaching text is John chapter 13 verses 34 to 35. I'm going to read it from the Christian Standard Bible. It will be on the slides. Then I'm going to pray for us and then we'll jump right in. This is Jesus speaking. He's with his disciples around a table, and here's what he says to them. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hear you loud and clear. There's nothing ambiguous to what you're saying. You are telling us, as our Messiah, as our King, as our Teacher, as the Lord of our lives, that we should do something. And you're also reminding us that you've set the example. So we are at your feet now, ready to hear you speak through your word. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would be attentive, that we would be excited, and that we would be, that our minds and hearts would be illuminated as we work through this portion of Scripture this morning. Use me, Lord Jesus. I'm at your disposal. Have me say the things that you would want me to say. I pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so we're in the Gospel of John. Two verses somewhere just past halfway in the book of John. We need some context, and I want to give that to you. So I'm going to show you two slides. The first slide is a breakdown of the whole gospel of John, and then the second slide is zoomed in to this specific portion, which is in chapter 13. So the only thing that I want you to see is that chapter 13 sits in the second half of John, 
It's after the first half that was full of miraculous signs and controversies around Jesus. John stated very clearly in an introduction exactly who Jesus is. And then Jesus did something phenomenal right in the middle of the book. And that was that he raised Lazarus from the dead. And now we are in this big section, chapter 13 to 17, where Jesus is busy speaking his final words. If I can have the next slide, please, Rudolf. So this is just zoomed in to this part. You'll see in chapter 13, that's where we are today, that Jesus washes his disciples' feet. I'm going to get back to that. And then he gives them his great command, or what we call today the new command. So you can see Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and then verse 34 being quoted here, love one another as I have loved you. Okay? The disciples don't quite understand why Jesus would do such a thing, but it is explained that this is a symbol of Jesus' life purpose. And that's to reveal God's nature as a being of self-giving love. We're going to get back to that. And for him to become a servant and die for the sins of the world. That's what chapter 13 is all about. And right after chapter 13, you'll see Jesus talking and talking and talking and talking and then eventually praying. And these are the topics that he is talking about. We won't get to that today, but that forms one big block in the Gospel of John. So you can call this a farewell discourse, right? Jesus is beginning to say goodbye and he begins with an announcement of his own glorification that's going to happen in his death. So his death might look like a loss, but it's actually a win. That's what it means. And then this whole portion of John ends with Jesus saying to his disciples, let's go. I'm on my way to face the cross. The setting, I said already, is a table. It's the Last Supper. However, if you are a Bible nerd, you'll see that the Last Supper is not described at all in the Gospel of John. Like we know that Jesus is around the table with his disciples having the Passover meal, but John doesn't mention it at all. That makes John different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The structure is clear, and this portion that we read today forms an introduction for this whole part that is to follow. So if you have your Bible open, just look quickly. Verse 31 and 32 is a separate portion. Verse 33, another separate portion. Then we read our teaching text, verse 34 to 35, that's another separate portion. And then verse 36 to 38 is also a separate portion. So this is a series of sayings brought together by John. Remember guys, John is a writer and he's got a story and he wants to tell you something. And he arranged his story so that it makes sense if you read it start to finish. So what John did is he took all of these sayings, put them all together, and used it as an introduction for this farewell discourse of Jesus. Now, uh, the reason why I'm mentioning all of these different sayings is if we take it all into account, that enables us to understand why the command to love one another is described as a new command. Because we've heard this before, haven't we? I mean, we know that this command is rooted in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, Love your neighbor as yourself, like we've heard this before. In the Shema, in the book of Deuteronomy, which is Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, we have heard before that you should love the Lord your God with everything in you. I'm just paraphrasing. So why is this called a new command if we've heard this before? The newness of this command consists in it being the law of the new order or the law of the new time. Remember, God's redemption is being brought forth through the death of Jesus. In and through Jesus, God is making all things new and giving everything a second chance and putting everything back together and reversing the effect of evil and sin. So a new time starts now. And in this new time, there's a new command. And that new command is love one another. So we are in an era of the new covenant. And this era of the new covenant was established through the sacrificial self-giving of Christ and His resurrection to rule. Let me give you a little grid. Okay? So we can divide the Bible into six movements. 
And these six movements come from a New Testament scholar who I have so much respect for. His name is N.T. Wright. He says, if you take the Bible, start to finish, you can divide it into these six movements. Creation, full, Israel. Right? That's the whole of the Old Testament. Then Jesus, then the church and the Spirit, and then redemption or restoration. You guys will see, I have a little uh, slash there, redemption slash restoration. I think we should make a new word. Because you can't really choose for one or the other. (laughs) Because what is waiting for us at the end of time is both. It's redemption and restoration. But that's the flow of the biblical story. And what is important for us to know, you know those info signs in a mall? When you move towards it and you see the map of the mall, what's the first thing you look for? Where am I? And then there's a nice big dot. You are here. Okay? You are here. That's really important. Like today, the 30th of April... 2023 is in this new era, the time of the church and the spirit. All of that lies in history, and this is what awaits us one day, redemption and restoration. And in this time, there's a new law, there's a new command, and Jesus gives it to his disciples for this time. And that is, love one another. Do you guys see it? So the commands of the law in the Old Testament were issued to Israel as their part in God's covenant with them. Remember, God said, I want to make a deal with you. And if we are entering into this deal, this is what I want you to do. Here are your laws. It's all written down. You need to follow them. So that was the, uh, the people of God's response to him taking them into a covenant. So this new command is our response to the redemptive act of God and the fact that He gave us grace and that He made us His people. Do you guys see it? So in the Old Testament, this is how I want you to respond to me. In the New Testament, this is how I want you to respond to me. And in classic Jesus style, He gives us one succinct sentence, right? It's one comprehensive law which fulfills all laws. And it's not only uh, the law for a new time, but it's also a law for a new life. Remember, Jesus said, I came to give you life and life in abundance. And then later in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am the life. So in me, you will find something brand new. And that is life that never ends. Our lives will never end. Like we'll physically die at some point, but we'll just keep on living Everlasting life, that's what it's called. And the rule for now, for the whole of everlasting life, is love one another. So it's a law for a new time. It's a law for a new life in the time of the church and the Spirit. Now this is a fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, right? Jeremiah said at some point that the new covenant, uh, sorry, that the new covenant in the last days, that which will come, will be accompanied by the law written upon the hearts of people. Right? It will be on the redeemed and renewed people of God's hearts. Let's read it together. Jeremiah 31, verse 33. This is Jeremiah speaking. He says, Instead, this is the covenant I will make with my house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Okay. Why is this important? If you've checked out already, check back in. Okay. Because I'm going to tell you now why this is a really important portion of scripture. It is important because a community of Christly love will be a revelation to the world of the reality that Jesus is actually alive. That Jesus actually makes things new. A community of Christly love will be a witness to the world of the presence and the power of Jesus Christ and of His Spirit and of the kingdom of God in our midst. 
Our lives speak louder than our words. So our lives are supposed to accompany our words. We do proclaim the gospel with our words. People hear the gospel after we proclaim it with our words, but then they use their eyes to see if this thing is true. And if the church loves one another in this way, they will see that it is true. We're going to get there once we study the two verses in our teaching text. This is the best possible way that I could map out these two verses. Here we go. The new command. Who is giving it? Who is it given to? What is it? And why is it given? Do you guys like the alliteration of the w sound? I thought it looks quite cool. Who's giving it? Who is it given to? What is it? And why is it given? Let's go deeper. Let's look at the first one, the new command. Who is giving it? I want to show you a slide. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, just to make sure that you are 100% sure who this book is about, tells us exactly who Jesus is. Like if you read the Gospel of John, the first chapter, you will stumble upon all of these beautiful descriptions of Jesus. Okay? He's the divine word that became human. He's, he carries God's tabernacle glory in the same way that God dwelt among His people. Jesus now dwells among God's people. And He is part of the one true God. So Father and Son, all the same. And later in the Gospel of John, the Spirit is described. And then we see a picture of the Trinity. Okay? He is an embodiment of God because your mind and your will gets embodied in your words and Jesus is called the Word. He's very clear about it from the beginning. And then in chapter 1, as Jesus walks the earth, already in chapter 1 we see seven titles given to Him by different people. Lamb of God, Son of Man, Rabbi, Son of... Oh, sorry, I already said Son of Man. Son of God, Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, King of Israel. The fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the Messianic King and Teacher of Israel and the Son of God who will die for the sins of the world. This is the one who is talking. So who is giving this command? God Himself embodied in Jesus. The one who says, I am, I am, I am, I am, all through the Gospel of John. The only person who used the words I am in the Old Testament was God, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Who's the only one using the words I am in the New Testament? Jesus. Why? Because he's the embodiment of this God. He says in the Gospel of John, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. I am he. Listen to me. And then after this part of John, in chapter 14, Jesus will say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in chapter 15, he'll say, I am the true vine. Question. Do you believe him? Because that is who he is. That's the one who says these words. And if you don't believe him, why not? Have you ever thought about that? Like if you struggle to believe God's words, if you struggle to believe him, why? I am an evangelist at heart. So when I have conversations about people, uh, with people about their faith, and they tell me that they don't believe or they can't believe, I just ask them why. Because I think it's a really good question. I don't want to argue with them. I also don't want to catch them off God. I just really need to know, why don't you believe this God? Because He's got all the authority, and He's got like all the corroboration for who He is. Like, it's proven. He's the only one that's never failed. Why don't you believe Him? He gives us a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a wish. It's an imperative. And a command means do it now. Parents in the house, you'll resonate with this. I mean, I love being a loving father to my kids and I love my two girls. There are moments where I tell them, 
You need to do this now. Nothing else. There are many things that they can do, but you know as a parent what they should do. Why? Because your view is infinitely wider and more comprehensive than theirs. And therefore, sometimes you look at your kids and say, you will do this now. Nothing else. And when they come back, what's the first thing you ask? Did you do what I told you to do? Because that's what you needed to do now. Can you guys imagine what God's view is like in your life? And how infinitely more deeper and wider he can see when it comes to you. He knows exactly what you need. And that is why he tells you what to do. Do you do it? When I run, I run a lot. That's why I always use that as a metaphor. When I run, I often ponder what it would be like to die now. And to be with Jesus, like what would that experience be like? And then I often think, what would the final judgment be like? And then I think of what would it be like if God would look me in the eye and ask me, did you do what I asked you to do? Just think about that. Just think about how visceral that question is. What if I appear before God in his judgment seat and he asks me this question, did you do what I asked you to do. Fam, I want to have one answer on that day, and that is absolutely nailed it. Not saying that I did it perfect, but that should be my only answer. If I imagine that moment, and I realize that I'm not busy with what God is uh, asking me to do, I need to repent, because He's given me a command, and that's something that I have to do. So the new command, who's giving it? God himself in Jesus Christ. Second one, who is it given to? Check this. The disciples around the table have been with Jesus for three years. They have seen with their own eyes everything he did. They have heard with their own ears First hand, every single word he spoke during his public ministry. These are the disciples who this command is given to. They were called by Jesus. Outstretched arm, follow me. Come after me. Come to me. And when they were called, they accepted the call. Like they actually responded. They took a leap of faith. The fishermen left their nets. The tax collector left his toll booth. And in a leap of faith, they accepted the call and they never left. These guys were good, right? They stuck it out for three years. And remember in the Gospel of John, after Jesus is teaching about the bread of life, many people left him. And then Jesus looked his disciples in the eyes and said, Guys, if you want out, it's now the time. But they stuck it out and they stayed with him. This group of people are different and their differences showed. Right? You've got a fisherman with a tax collector. The tax collector takes the fisherman's fish. With the fisherman and the tax collector, you have a zealot who carries a sword who's ready to make war and overthrow the Roman Empire. With the fisherman and the tax collector and the zealot, you've got a thief who loves money. His name is Judas Iscariot. They had all of these little factions in their group. All of these little struggles. This is the group who Jesus gives this command to. The people who Jesus gives this to had clean feet. Because Jesus washed it. He just did it. They saw and experienced firsthand their teacher, their rabbi, the one who said and did everything over the last three years, kneel before them in his vest, washing their dirty Havayana 
flip-flop Jerusalem cruiser feet. I mean, my feet's clean at the moment because it's in a valley. Those guys didn't have valleys. Their feet were dirty. But they had clean feet because they just saw with their own eyes what Jesus did. And while Jesus did it, here's what he tells them. Let's read John chapter 13, verses 13 to 17. He says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. Truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his master, and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, check this, you are blessed if you do them. Anyone up for some blessing? Like, who wouldn't want to be blessed? All of us want to be hashtag blessed. Do you know how you're blessed? Do what Jesus tells you to do. That's what he says. Question, do you believe him? Obviously, I asked that before. So this is who he gives this uh, example to. Now, let's think about us. Think about yourself as you think of the disciples. Fam, you have also seen and heard firsthand with your own eyes and your own ears who God is, what He has done for you, and what the truth is. None of us accepted Jesus Christ because it was a great argument. We actually experienced something of Him. You know what it's like to be found by God's grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. You remember that. You remember what it's like to open up the Bible and then God speaks from it. You remember what it's like to see a sunrise like I did this morning and just hear the whole creation sing the glory of God. You have your own experiences of God. It's not all first-hand historically like the disciples had it, but we have it. You were also called by God. You also accepted, if you are a Christian, uh, the gift of faith from God. You also took a leap of faith. I remember the evening that I came to faith, my only prayer was, Lord Jesus, I have made a massive mess of my life. Please take it all. There you go. I've got no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. That was the leap of faith. But I can't carry on like this anymore. So there you go. Everything. Me. My life. And God began, uh, started a marvelous journey of restoration and repair the following day. We are just as different as the disciples were. And it shows in our church. We are diverse and we are different and we sometimes don't understand one another. That's not an excuse not to live out the new command. And you, as an individual, have clean feet because Jesus washed it for you. Have you ever felt that closeness of God? The same closeness that the disciples felt that evening when Jesus knelt in front of them. We have been given a new command. So the new command, who's giving it? Who is it given to? Let's look at the third one. What is it? Simple one. Look at all the highlights in our teaching text and count the word love. Love, loved, love, and love. The new command is all about love. The Greek word for love in this portion of scripture is the Greek word agape. It's on the slide. Agape. That's how you say it. A Agape. Agape. Now, let's riff a little on this word. Because this word carries the whole meaning of our teaching text. So I'm going to give you some descriptions for what this word means. And we'll pause at each description to just ask ourselves, how are we doing here? Because it's our command, and it's given to us by God. So now I'm going to explain what it is, and then we need to pause and ask ourselves, is this how we are loving? So agape is one of several Greek words for love. I can't give you the others now, otherwise I'll go too long. 
But when the word agape is used in the Bible, it refers to, listen to the words, pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. Let's pause here. Is that how you love? Willful, pure, sacrificial, intentionally desiring another's highest good, not your own. Agape differs from other types of love in the Bible. It is the highest, most pure form of love, and check, this is the important word, as a choice, not out of attraction or obligation. When you love in the agape way, you don't love because it looks attractive to you. You also don't love because that is what is expected of you. You love because you choose to love. How often do we only love what is attractive to us? How often do we only love because we are obliged to do it? That's not agape. Agape is choosing it. And listen to the description. It's a high form of love. It's a pure form of love. The New Testament references agape over 200 times. The word itself is used 106 times in the New Testament. It is a high priority word. Question. How high on your priorities for today is agape? Like we have to prioritize. We have to choose what we're going to do with every single minute of every single day. We've got something called time, talents and treasures. We all have the same 24 hours today. I assume that you've got some form of a to-do list. Where's love? Because if it's mentioned or referenced 200 times in the New Testament, it should be right at the top. How am I loving God and loving others today? And if we want to be the real deal, then we should reorient our lives around that. Agape in the Bible, listen to this, this is crucial, is a love that comes from God. It comes from Him. It originates from Him. Why? Because it's part of His character. The Bible says God is love. God's love isn't sentimental, warm and fuzzy, dry throat, butterflies in the stomach. He is love. It's part of His character. And it comes from Him. Do you experience this? Do you know the intimate love of God? Because if you don't, you'll have none to share. And if you do, you'll have plenty to share. It's actually so beautiful because it's so easy. Let God love you and then share that love with others. That's the recipe. Every single time I preach at a wedding, that's exactly what I tell a couple. You're marrying a sinner and you're marrying a sinner, so you guys are going to have a hard time. But here's the key. Experience God's love and share it with your spouse. That's it. If you think that you can love your wife out of your own, do you in for a hard time. But let God lavish you with His love. You'll have more than enough share with your spouse. Do you know this? We've already said that agape is a choice. We've already said that it is a deliberate striving for another highest good, for another's highest good. Now it's important to see that agape is demonstrated through action. Agape is demonstrated through action. Why? Because God set the standard for agape in sending Jesus to die for us. While we were still sinners. Like there was a proper job. Action. I am love. I will show my love. Not by only thinking about my deep love. That I have for humanity. I'm going to take action. And I'm going to do something about it. Have you ever. 
loved people in your head, but never with your hands or with your mouth or with your feet or with your body or with your stuff. I think that's where we're lacking, fam, as a church. Like up here, we love all people. Everyone is created in God's image. He sent His Son to die for everyone. Whew. Did a great job in loving today. Let me open up my Instagram feed and do some mindless scrolling. That's not agape. And also, I'm not saying that it's always mindless scrolling on Instagram. I'm just saying that sometimes it's mindless scrolling on Instagram. It's actions. God took action in sending Jesus to die on our behalf so that we can be saved from a sinful existence, that we can be reconciled to Him, that we can be close to Him, that He can send His Spirit to us so that He can reverse the curse, so that He can put us and everything around us back together so that in the end He can make everything new. That's the good news. And the good news started with action. It started with God showing His love through us. Agape love doesn't come naturally to us in our sinful state. However, it does come naturally to God. It's an integral part of His character. And by drawing closer to Him and experiencing His love, we can begin to understand what this love really means. Only through Him can we show and experience this love. Repentance, dependence. Repentance, dependence. Repentance, dependence. That's what it's all about. If we fall short, we repent. And when we repent, we say, I depend on you to help me to get this love from you so that I can love others. How often do you repent, fam? We're supposed to do it daily. Because none of us can have a perfect day. Like you might have a rapper one day in four months, but it's still not a perfect day. Repentance, but with repentance doesn't come chastising yourself and telling God how poor you are. It's saying, God, I rely on you and I depend on you. Please lavish me again with your love. The new command. Who's giving it? Who is it given to? What is it? Let's land with this one. Why is it given? Just give me a couple more minutes. I'll be done. Let's look at the highlights in verse 35 of the teaching text. Two really fascinating words in here. By this, everyone, look at the highlight, will know. And then the second highlight, that you are my disciples. We're just going to look at these two highlights. First one, will know. It's a fascinating Greek word. And it means more than only this one selection that was made in this translation. It does mean will know. But it means they will realize, they will discover, right? Discovery means something is covered, and now it's uncovered. And then you discover it. Do you guys see it? So, uh, uh, Jesus uses the words, they will discover through you and the way that you love one another. And it also means you will personally believe it. It involves experience. I didn't think that I was going to use a food illustration, but now I am because I'm quite hungry. Think about me telling you about Mondanet Butchery in Irene Link's Bultong. Okay? Medium weight, medium fat, beautiful, free range beef Bultong. When are you going to believe what I say? Is when you put it in your mouth. And you go, mm, oh, oh, this is good. And then the hand goes back into the little brown paper bag. I've got no vegetarian or vegan uh, 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 comparison. Make up your own, sorry. I'm just saying, just saying, that you will personally believe what I say about the bultong when you taste it. That word means, in Greek, they will know that it is true. That's why this command is given to us. 
so that the world who hears the gospel proclaimed to them will discover it. They will realize it. They will personally experience it. They will know that the words we say is actually true when we love one another. Think about it. Jesus loves you, and now I love you, and I love this person. It's all true, man. Instead of, Jesus loves you, and there's no real experience of that love. That's why it's given to us, so that people will know. Secondly, people will know what? That you are my disciples. Disciple means learner. That means people will know that you are learning from me. Are you learning from Jesus? Psychology tells us at the age of 25, many people stop learning for the rest of their lives. That means what I believe when I'm 25, they'll carry me through. And then you become a hot-headed, cold-hearted, really selfish kid in an adult's body because no one can teach me anything. Or are you teachable? Are you currently learning from Jesus? Because Jesus says, if you love one another, people will know that you are actually learning from me. Why? Because then you imitate me. Do you guys remember those old school WWJD material little bracelets? I see that they're actually still on the market. What a joy. <laughs> I, saw one wearing, I saw someone wearing one the other day and I was like, dude, where did you get that? Like from a memory box in the 90s. And the guy goes, no, dude, I bought it at the Christian bookstore last week. And I'm like, sweet, man. I think I should get myself one of those again. Burgundy, eh? or black, or rainbow colored, or whatever. What would Jesus do? That's what we ask as his learners. And if we love one another, people will see that we are actually taking our cues from him. Why? Because we are correctly representing him then we are living in a way that is consistent with Jesus. People will know that you are the real deal because you're representing Him well. I said this in the beginning, let me say it again. A community of Christly love will be a revelation to the world of the reality of the gospel. Like God's redemption will be seen as real. God's presence will be seen as real. God's power, God's spirit, God's kingdom will be seen as real. And we will be a witness to all of that present in the world. That's why this new command is given to us. Question. And I'm going to land us with this one. Will people discover, will people personally believe that Jesus is the real deal by looking at your life? That's the test. I'm going to ask that again. Will people discover and personally believe that Jesus is the real deal by looking at your life? life this command was given to us by him to love so that everyone will discover will personally believe that Jesus is the real deal I think the only appropriate response today is to submit and to say, well, Jesus, if that is what you want to do, then do it in me and do it through me. Lord Jesus, we, we want to do this. We want to obey your command. We don't have a choice. But we want to be blessed. And we don't want, just want to do this because we're blessed. We want to do this because we know that through this, everyone will know, will see, and will discover. It doesn't come naturally for us, Lord Jesus. We said that now. But we know that you have an abundance of it. 
And therefore, my prayer is that all of us would be deeply aware of how much you love us, how accessible that love is, and how beautiful this life of love is that you've called us to. Soften our hearts now, Lord Jesus. Open our minds as we sing this song in response to you. I pray that in your name. Amen.